Good evening and uh, welcome to our worship together at Churches tonight. One of the words that uh, I think describes God, uh, what we use, is incomprehensible. We're dealing with concepts that we just, our minds just aren't big enough to, uh, to take hold of. And in the opening line to this hymn, uh, 349, it passes knowledge, that dear love of thine, my Saviour Jesus, yet this soul of mine, would of thy love, in all its breadth and length, and its height and depth, and everlasting strength, know more and more. Yeah, with our finite minds, we try to comprehend something of the wonder of God and his love. As uh, we meet together tonight. If we turn in the word to Ruth chapter 1. We read the whole chapter. Ruth chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was it. Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Marathon and Chilothon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab, and they remained there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orphra, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. And both Marthathon and Chilathon died. And so the woman survived as two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughter-in-laws <coughs> that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard the country of Moab, in the country of Moab, that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out of the place where she was and her two daughter-in-laws with her and went on her way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dwelt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. And so she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will, we will return with your people. But Naomi, Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husband? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. <clears throat> and I say I have hope. Should, should I have a husband tonight, would, should I also bear sons? Would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourself from giving husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much. That for your sakes, that the hand of the Lord has, has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following you. Wherever you will go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge, and your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and where you are buried, I will be buried. The Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death pass, parts me from you. 
and she saw that she was determined to go with her and stop speaking to her. And the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they came to Bethlehem, all the city was excited of them because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, and she returned to the country of Moab. And now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. I really wanted a... I felt we needed a devotional passage tonight, that that was what I needed to speak on. Uh, I think it's been an underlying theme uh, of many of the messages over the past uh, months. And the question the Lord, I'm sure, would ask you of us is not so much what will you do for me, but do you still really love me? And in this passage, there's a very beautiful uh, passage of Ruth's promise to Naomi uh, from verse 16 to verse 18. And I want to, to take that in a way, or, or to think about Ruth's commitment to Naomi and it parallel that with our commitment to the Lord. Uh, but just to, to start with, of course, the context of the, uh, the book of Ruth, we read in the beginning of verse 1, in the time of the judges. Uh, the time of the judges was a low time in the people of Israel. A time of lawlessness, a time when they had forsaken their covenant with God and had turned after foreign gods. A time that was large, in many senses, leaderless. We read very often, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And even when the Lord did raise up leaders to, to save them or to help them, men like Samuel, uh, Samson or Gideon, they were actually really very weak men in, in morally, in many ways. They were, may have been mightily used by the Lord, but they were still very weak men. It was a low time. I remember uh, years ago when Barry and Janet were sitting there and I spoke on one of the passages from Judges. And afterwards, Barry said to me, look, I've been studying Judges in my um, personal Bible time. Uh, and look, this is the conclusion that I've written. This must surely be the saddest book in the Bible. Uh, and, uh, but more than that, of course, it ends with two, two little stories. Uh, one is the story of... Um, his name, of the, uh, the Micah's idolatry, a story of one man's idolatry that became a whole uh, tribe's idolatry and eventually became almost the nation's idolatry or the northern kingdom's idolatry, and it just shows how much a relatively minor thing uh, spreads and corrupts. But the, the concluding story is um, of the Le Levite's concubine, one of the most depraved and brutal stories in the Bible. Desperate time, and uh, the whole sort of phrase of uh, mired in sin really seems to be uh, applicable to the people of God there. They seem to be in a hopelessly lost, even when they're trying to get out of the mess they're in. Desperate time, 
but there's a but God moment. Moment. There was a, th- a third book in that trilogy, because of course the Book of Ruth was originally part of the Book of Judges. It was a, uh, was um, grouped with it, and we have this lovely story. Same time, same place, of a godly people, faithful people, uh, dwelling in peace in a sort of pastoral setting. And we have this this little micro story that in a sense leads us to the whole gospel, that reveals the kinsman redeemer, that gives us a glimpse of uh, of God's plan of redemption, how a life can be taken from a a state of a lostness, bitterness, hurt, alienation, and become part of a very central part of a people uh, and have a, a great role and find security and love and a future there. It gives us some sort of a glimpse of God's plan of salvation. This lovely book uh, that we have, and it, it's almost that God just couldn't leave. <laughs> the story of Judges where it was. He had to show that there were good people that loved him and all that were seeking to serve him at that time. And it's uh, worth, as we start tonight, in, in perhaps remembering that, um, that in a way that the world would portray itself, if you look at the secular media, the secular new news, Anything really of God is, is filtered out. Uh, and even when they try and portray the better side of humanity, it's actually hedonistic, it's superficial, it's very sentimental. Beneath the surface, it shows a, as a great emptiness, a lostness in this nation. And that's not the complete picture. The Lord, as we know, still has his people. Uh, I always remember this, this, share this story with you. It's from a long time ago. But back in the 80s, probably the mid-80s, it was when Live Aid was on, uh, people, young people from Lay Hill did a sort of exchange with a, uh, people from Stratford Methodist Church in the east end of London. The, the young people from there stayed at Lay Hill, and then we went to stay in Stratford uh, Methodist Church over a weekend. And in, on the Sunday morning, taking a family service, uh, or taking part in a family service, as part of the prayers of Thanksgiving, there was a, this pile of uh, pictures from magazines, from newspapers, that the, uh, the children, or well, and others could pick up and just go to the front and say, thank you, God, for whatever it was, uh, this picture. During that time, a dear brother, who was a senior steward there, went to the front and uh, just said, I'm going to make a sign of the cross with my hands. And he then opened up to say everything that the cross meant to him the wonder of the way that God had saved him. And it was very moving. This man who really had understanding of the Lord and his salvation and was so, so grateful for it. Uh, His name was Albert. He lived in Albert Square in the East End. He and his wife ran the, the house group there. You see, in the real Albert Squares, in the real East End, godly men and women still exist. In media fantasies, they don't. But you see, that's our, our world, our society, that God still has a faithful remnant. It is still a day of grace. And we don't need to let the devil run the, win the propaganda battle that somehow all is lost. It may be a very late hour. But just as in the time of Ruth, the time of Judges, there were good people, there were people like Boaz, through through whom the Lord could reveal his purposes, there still is today. And we should thank God for being part of that. Anyway, that's perhaps a digression. 
Uh, I just wanted, it's very simple, but to parallel Ruth's decision to follow Naomi with our decision to follow Christ. First of all, a choice had to be made. Ruth had a choice, go back to her old life or to go to a new life, an unknown life, a step of faith uh, to go with Naomi. There was no compromise. She couldn't have her old life and stay with Naomi. She had a decision to make. And we had a decision when we came to the Lord whether to commit our lives to him, to follow him, or whether to stay where we are, uh, to, to live in our old lives. As Jesus said, uh, you cannot serve two masters. If we commit our lives to him, we commit all our lives to him. We follow uh, what he wants us to do, or we seek out his plans, we seek out his word. It's a choice that we make to go in this direction. Not knowing, there's a decision of faith, not knowing what it will bring, but leaving an old life behind. And that's the choice that Ruth made, and the choice that we've had to make or have to make. Second thing is it, it was a choice that was freely made. Ruth made that decision completely off her own back. She wasn't coerced, she wasn't pressured. Uh, in fact, it was almost the reverse of that. But there was nothing there to, to force her or to persuade her to go with Naomi. She chose to do that. We live in a society or world which is seeking to manipulate us and control us in more or less every direction. Uh, businesses, governments, it, advertising, the media, all around us, they're seeking to get us to, to do what they want, to buy their products, to, be, to join their systems. There's, and there's coercion, there's pressures, uh, there's persuasion. All these things are, are put upon our lives. When the Lord called us, there was no pressure, no coercion. Though in a sense we may have been convicted by the Holy Spirit, we may say that was pressure, but it's a choice that we freely make and made. It's to say in the Methodist covenant service every year, I freely and wholeheartedly commit myself to you. Uh, that was our original choice, it's our choice now. Jesus never pressurised or manipulated anyone. When someone like the rich young ruler came to him, uh, in, in Mark's Gospel particularly, it says Jesus loved that man. He was so, so close to the kingdom, and yet Jesus let him walk away. He didn't go running after him. He didn't offer him a compromise. The choice that Ruth made to go with Naomi was freely her choice. Our choice to follow the Lord and to commit our lives to him is freely and wholeheartedly ours. It's not one that he forces upon us. The, second, the next uh, point is that it was a decision that was made on re relationship. Well, well, relationship was very important. It wasn't that Ruth was seeking a, a new life in a new land, although probably she was. It was that Ruth loved Naomi, that she was committed to her, that she was going to follow her and stay with her. It's said of Christianity that it is not a religion, it is a, a relationship. We do not follow a set of rules as such. We do not have things to do, like make pilgrimages or... Um, have fast or those sort of things. Our commitment is one of following the Lord. It is an appreciation of the salvation that he has brought to us. And as a response to that, uh, we see something of his love and grace and we seek to follow him. 
him and to be with him and build a relationship with him through his word and through his through prayer. It is a decision that is, or a life that is based on relationship, not on rules, not on religion. And as Naomi committed, as Ruth committed herself to go in with Naomi, we commit ourselves to following Jesus, wherever that leads. Not a set of rules, not somewhere with a map uh, that directs us. No, a set of plans. We take his leading upon our lives and we seek to follow him. Ruth was faithful in the commitment that she made. She stuck with Naomi. Uh, she followed it through. She obeyed the instructions Naomi gave her. Of course, that led to great blessing. Our commitment is to uh, very much for us, particularly in these times, to remain steadfast in our loyalty to the Lord. Uh, to do what his word says, to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, to follow through those promises that we're made. And sometimes I think many Christians will say this, they hold on just by the promises that they made. There's the fact, I have promised, therefore I will keep going. I don't understand where I'm at, I don't understand what the, what's happening around me, but I have promised. I'm in this relationship and I'm going to remain faithful, I'm going to be steadfast, I'm going to keep going. Ruth, I don't think, had appeared to have great challenges in what happened in the following verses. But um, anyway, she stuck with, with, what, with Naomi and she stuck with what Naomi told her to do. And the final thing is uh, really that that choice led to provision. She, went, she was in a state of poverty. They... Uh, a state of barrenness, a state of uh, being very vulnerable, uh, a state of being an alien, she had left one land, uh, but as she entered another, she had no, no, in a sense, citizenship there, she was just a, a foreigner. She took very little into that situation. And everything was provided for her. She was provided with a husband, with a future, with security, uh, with wealth, and uh, with a place in the people of God. A very special place where she became part of the royal line. She became King David's grandmother. <laughs> he was a descendant from her. Uh, she had a place in the genealogy, one of the only four women that did. She was taken from a state of being completely outside the, what was it, like the purposes of God to having a central role. She was redeemed. Boaz redeemed her. He brought her, her, well, the family back and her, his rights to her as part of that. And of course, the Lord has provided for us what we could never achieve for ourselves in a terms of seeking salvation was provided for us on the cross. Atonement, forgiveness of sin, a new life has been provided for us. A new citizenship has been provided for us, that we are citizens of heaven, that we have a place in the kingdom of God. that we have a future in heaven. We, that we are secure in the Lord's purposes. Nothing can seize us from his hand, from his care. He will never leave us or forsake us. We are secure. 
something so many people out there are longing for, so desperately insecure. We're secure in his purposes, in the eternal plans of God, and we have a heavenly home to go to. So very simply tonight, I just want to ask you, in this prayer, uh, entreaty that uh, Ruth makes, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people should be my people. Attorney. And uh, your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And where you buried, I will be buried. And the Lord do to me also, if I do uh, more also, if anything parts you from me. Can you make that sort of thing a prayer to the Lord? In these troubled times, a wholehearted, freely offered prayer, just out of love and commitment, you say, now in these times, yeah, I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be with you. And may nothing separate us. Thank you.